As we begin this new year, I am reminded that every new year is a wonderful opportunity for us to look at the possibilities that lay before us. A sense of promise and possibility in the 365 days of each calendar year as we stand here at the beginning of those days. So many times we begin our new year with hope in our hearts as we think about how things will change and be different in the new year. But sociological bean counters who spend their time studying such things tell us that barely one in three of us continue to make traditional New Year's resolutions. And I think one of the reasons why is because so often we fail in meeting those resolutions before the second week of January has even ended. We give up on the possibility of the new year being different from the previous year. So I started doing a little bit of research and I found that the tradition of making New Year's resolutions actually dates back to the early Babylonians. They tended towards the pragmatic, like most of us do when we've made resolutions in the past. Most often, they resolved to return borrowed farm equipment. Well, if we look at resolutions a little bit differently today, almost like a spiritual bucket list, If we looked at our resolutions, instead of resolving to let go of things, instead of resolving to do things by our intentions and our inventions, if we looked at this new year as a time to start living by God's intentions, living our lives more closely to the way that God has called us to live. In the letter to the church at Ephesus, the Apostle Paul is writing to these young Christians as they are beginning their church and struggling with their differences and their diversities and their conflicts with one another. And he is instructing them on how to live as disciples of Jesus Christ how to live in community and in a world that is counter to the life that Christ has called them to live. His instructions to them struck me this week as I thought in particular about that last verse that I read for you today where he says to be careful in how we live, to seek every opportunity to live a faithful life, to live as wise, not as foolish ones, to live following the ways of Christ every day. And the ways that God has called us to live are ways that will give us an abundant life. For Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus wants us to live a full and meaningful life. And so God's resolution for all of us is that this new year will be an abundant year, an abundant year for each one of us filled with those gifts of joy, hope, peace, and love that the Christ child came to bring to us. This new year offers us a unique vantage point to look at the past and how we have lived our lives and the choices that we have made and to look towards the future and how we might change so that we can live that abundant life that Christ has called us to live. You know, the month of January is named after the Roman god Janus who faced both directions at the same time. That Roman god had two faces, one face on the head pointed towards the past and one face on the head pointed towards the future. That's where we are this day. 
at a point where we can look at the past and pause and reflect on the choices that we have made and what choices are before us in this new year. And so those spirits cohabitate today, nostalgia and hope. As I think about my future moving forward in this new year, I was reminded of that old movie, The Bucket List, that came out way back in 2008. Some of you may remember that movie about two older men who spend several months together traveling around the world, making time for those items on their list that they want to accomplish before they die. And along their journey, these two partners learn some deep spiritual things about themselves. They come through life-changing moments together. And in the end, the movie's message is very simple. The message is, move in the direction of your dreams and your hopes. Don't put off for tomorrow what you can do today so that you can live your life without regrets. Well, my dear friends, not only is this a new year for me, but it is a time when I stand at the precipice of a new decade. As hard as it might be to believe, for me, I will be turning 60 this month. I am now a grandma for the first time. And I am looking at life a little bit differently. Wondering how many more years do I have to walk on this earth? And what kind of legacy will I be leaving for the persons whose lives I have touched? As I reach this milestone in my life, I am thinking about what has my life meant so far? What kind of meaning and what kind of difference have I added to the world in these almost 60 years that I've walked it? It's hard to believe. What have I done with all of that time? And what meaning and what difference has it made? And I begin to think about what is on my bucket list. Not just my bucket list, like the men in that movie, of things I want to do, like places that I want to go see and activities that I want to partake in, but my spiritual bucket list, the things that God has called me to do, the ways of living wisely and not foolishly, the ways of walking in the footsteps of Christ. And I am reminded that Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. God has given us a very large dream, my friends, a dream of the coming of the kingdom, something we pray about every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. And we are called to be participants of helping to bring God's kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. The Apostle Paul tells us, be very careful how you live, make the most of every opportunity to live wisely in building that kingdom, to live wisely in making it happen. Well, there's a quote, and I don't know who it originally came from, but it's one that I like, and it says, let's not measure our life by minutes, but by the moments that make a difference. You see, I believe at this point in my life that life is not just about the big things we do, but it's about the little things that we do every day, the little choices that we make, the small things that make an impact on other people's lives. Many of you know that my sister Debbie has been critically ill since December the 18th, and she continues to be in the intensive care unit at Richland Medical Center right now. But many of you have done small things that have made a huge difference in my life, and I want to thank you for that. You have sent me email messages. You have called me. You have sent me text messages. 
You have let me know that you are praying for us. You have sent me greeting cards in the mail. And I've even had one dear soul in this congregation who made homemade soup and bread and delivered it so that we might be nourished physically during these difficult days while Debbie is so ill. The good news is Debbie is improving every day. We made the tough decision this week to move her off the ventilator and insert a tracheotomy. And she was able to breathe through that trach yesterday without the assistance of the ventilator. So I am overjoyed with that progression. It's the little things, my friends, that make a difference in this world. The little things that we do for one another every day, like calling each other and checking on one another. You know, as I thought about the little things, I realized that in my house I have a miracle room. I wonder if any of y'all have a miracle room. A room in your house that somehow just magically seems to get cleaned by itself. A room in your house where things just seem to be put back into order magically. Well, my miracle room in my house is part of my kitchen. Every morning, my husband gets up before I do, and he goes into the kitchen to make coffee. And while the coffee is brewing, he unloads the dishwasher and puts all the dishes neatly away. He organizes the kitchen and cleans it so that when I get up, after he's brought the cup of coffee to the bed for me, the kitchen is all in order and ready for the day. A miracle room, a small act of love that he does every day. Small acts of kindness make a big difference. Sometimes it's a simple meal. Sometimes it's taking time to spend with someone who's lonely to let them know they're not alone. Sometimes it's deciding to be with someone who is grieving a loss. Just sitting with them. I've seen it happen over and over again in every church that I've served. How these small little acts, one upon the other, can truly change someone's life and world. Lift someone up from discouragement and depression. And help them to know that they are important. That they matter in this world. Reverend Douglas Meyer tells about a man who claimed to be the most accurate fortune teller in the world. He said a man once came to this fortune teller and said he had only one question about his future, and this was it. How will my life end? And the fortune teller glazed into that crystal ball in front and then announced, My dear friend, your life will end when you die. Well, he was accurate. The man nodded and he said, well, okay, but will I be happy? And the fortune teller said, oh, that has nothing to do with your future. That has to do with your present, with the choices that you make. This day will come and this day will go, someone told me recently but what you do with it is up to you. Choices each day. God's will is that we choose to live the abundant life every day, that we believe the gospel and cherish the truth. And that does not mean that we will not go through difficult times in life, but it means that we will not let circumstances determine our joy in the living of each day. Like the Apostle Paul who wrote these words to the church in Ephesus, we can live as those who are content with every day. We can live as those who live with hope, hope, hope in a better day coming. There's a little book titled Daily Grace that contrasts two little animals in God's kingdom, 
that reside side by side in streams and ponds of North America. One animal is the beaver, and the beaver works every day, all throughout the day, toppling trees to create large river dams. The other animal is the river otter. The otter delights in making a game of everything. Otters catch what they need to survive, but they also make time to chase after pebbles, to slide down slopes, and to tweak their tails at their industrious neighbors, the beavers. Both animals, he says, live in the same stream. They live about the same length of time, but you have to believe that the otters enjoy life just a little bit more than the beavers do. Otters seem perfectly content if they have enough food and they're happy to live in their little mud holes along the river. Even in old age, they never miss the opportunity to toss a stone into the water and catch it before it reaches the bottom. And so his question to us is, are we going to live as beavers or are we going to live as otters? What kind of small choices are we going to make every day to bring joy and laughter into our own lives and to the lives of others around us? You see, both animals have their place in God's kingdom, but I wonder how many people miss out on the opportunities for joy and light in this world that God offers to us simply because we are too focused on what the future might hold. We're so busy trying to make a living that we never live our lives. My dear friends, deciding to be the hands and feet of Christ, reaching out to others in ways that bring joy and laughter into their lives, will bring joy and laughter into our lives in this new year. So as you think about how you will spend this next 365 days in front of us, I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you to find a quiet place later today and sit down and make a list, a list of those dreams that are upon your heart, a list of people that maybe you could touch with joy and laughter in this new year. Write down those truths that you feel God is placing upon your heart of ways that you can use your time, your talent, your gifts, your treasures. Ways that you can give life, light, and joy to this world and see it come back to you. Now, why am I asking you to write it down? I'm asking you to write it down for two reasons. One is because when you write it down on a piece of paper, then you can look at it and evaluate it. You can evaluate it in that light that Paul calls us to evaluate our lives. Are you making wise choices with the use of your time, your talent, and your treasure? Are you making wise use of every moment in your life? And the second reason to write it down is it allows you to take ownership of it, to own it, and to say, this is what I'm going to do. These are the things I'm going to work on so that I might walk in the footsteps of Christ in this new year. You know, I'm told that the great, great baseball player, Babe Ruth, used to grab his bat and stand, look at the pitcher, and then point to where he was going to hit the ball. Now, why did he do that? He was calling his shot. He was telling the pitcher, when I hit it, that's where it's going to go. By doing that, he was telling everyone around him that he was either going to be a hero and do what he said he was going to do, or he was going to be a failure and not make it, not be able to make it. My friends, in writing our list, we are calling our shot. And that's what Jesus did. 
In the Gospels, we are told that he said to his disciples, the Son of Man will go to Jerusalem and he will die. And on the third day, he will be raised. And that same power that raises me from the grave is the power that will be given to you. All who are baptized in my name, all who seek to follow in my steps, that same power that raised me from the dead will be given to you so that you may do even greater things than I have done. That's the power of the Holy Spirit at work in each one of our lives today, my friends. The power to help us call the shots on how we will live as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. The power to help us actually live that spiritual bucket list in this new year. May we have the faith and the courage to live that way. Because I think about it, as I started to put my list together, here are some things I thought about with regard to the future. God resolves to give us direction and diligence and courage to move forward with faith. So what if instead of resolving to read more books this year, I put on my spiritual bucket list that I would spend time with young children or with persons who are illiterate, helping them to learn how to read, and then they could read those books to me? How can I turn around some of the things that I might put on a New Year's resolution list and make them a spiritual bucket list. Well, instead of resolving to get more exercise, maybe I could exercise my spiritual muscles and pray more often. Participate in a Bible study in this community. Maybe instead of resolving to spend less time in front of the television, I could resolve to spend more time with friends and family. Instead of resolving to spend just quality time with friends and family, maybe I could resolve to invite my friends and family to join me in mission work, either here at the soup cellar or in the community, doing something good for others. Our life commitment, my friends, to a spiritual bucket list, to living a life that counts. May it be so for you and for me, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.